Faith for Today with Colin Urquhart and Julia Fisher. verses in in the Acts of the Apostles and uh, you're reading from your version of the New Testament, The Truth, asking the question, what about Acts for today? So the apostles, uh, we left them on the top of the Mount of Olives. They had watched Jesus ascend into heaven, but not before he'd given them instructions that they had to wait until the Holy Spirit was sent to them. And you made the point how in the subsequent time while they were waiting they met and prayed constantly together they must have been keen to get on with the job wondering what was going to happen but uh, you ask a question what was God doing in their lives during those 10 days and he was bringing them into that place of unity with one another because once the spirit was given the church was going to immediately grow we, we read here in verse 15 of 120 of them that were meeting together but on the day that the spirit was given another 3,000 became believers so they were going to need this 120 to disciple that 3,000. There wasn't going to be any time for the bickering, the squabbling, the jealousies, and the other uh, sort of issues that would seem to go on among the disciples during the gospel period. No, they were going to be of one heart and one mind, all working together with a common aim and objective. And... Um, So uh, it says in verse 15, during this period, Peter addressed the group of 120 believers saying, my brothers, it was necessary for the scripture referring to Judas to be fulfilled. This scripture was given by the Holy Spirit through David's words. Even though he was one of us and shared this ministry with us, Judas guided those who arrested Jesus. This Judas bought a field with the money he was paid for his betrayal, and it was there that he fell and his intestines burst out of his body. This was common knowledge in Jerusalem, and the field was named in Aramaic as the field of blood. Peter continued, It is written in the Psalms, Let his place be desolate so that no one can live there, and let another take his position. Therefore we must choose someone to replace him, one of the men who has been among us throughout the time the Lord Jesus was with us, from the time of John's baptism to the time when he was taken from us by ascending to heaven. The one we elect must, like us, be a witness of his resurrection. Two men were put forward, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they all prayed, Lord, you know every person's heart. Make clear to us which of these two is your choice to share in this apostolic ministry in the place of Judas who has gone where he belongs. Matthias was chosen by casting lots and was added to the eleven apostles. Now, what has this got to teach us for today? This is the only place in the whole of the New Testament where we have an election. And what has happened in the church, in so many churches, people elect their leaders, they elect people to positions. But if you look at what happened after the Spirit came, people were appointed, not elected. This election took place because the Spirit of God had not yet come upon the body of believers. So, you know, they were really left in the position of, well, we've got to decide. Um, you know, let's just pray and, and, and see who gets elected. But once the Spirit had come, people were appointed. And Paul, when he's um, bringing up these young believers, Timothy and Titus, uh, to to be leaders in the church, he is telling them, appoint elders wherever you go. And the principle upon which he was really teaching them to appoint people was to see how the Spirit of God was using them and to recognize the ministries that God was giving them. You see, this is very different from appointing someone who is, po- uh, sorry, electing somebody who is popular or electing people, you know, because they're good givers to the church or whatever, whatever, whatever. I mean, there can be all kinds of different reasons and motives that go behind elections. But it's interesting to me that this is the only place in the New Testament where an election is recorded. Because, you see, in the New Testament church, the Holy Spirit was very much seen to be the one that was needed to be in control. So I don't see this as a model for the church 
because even in Scripture it didn't become a model for the church. That uh, there's no there's no teaching in the rest of the New Testament that says right now when you need leaders have an election, but quite the opposite. See what the Holy Spirit is doing. See who He's anointing. See who He's raising up, and appoint them. Well, if churches today are going to adopt that procedure, Colin, there's going to have to be some drastic rethinking. Yes, but. Kingdom faith has existed for over 30 years, and that's how we have existed throughout that time. We've never had an election for anybody in any position whatsoever. Yeah. We see how God is using people, and we appoint them accordingly. So, you know, it can be done today. Um, yes, okay, uh, in many situations that would require a revolution. But, you know, no matter how it is, that people are appointed, even if it is by election, surely what must happen is they must be the people of God's appointing because it is seen that the anointing of God's Spirit is upon them, because it is seen that the qualities of his life and love and power and leadership, if we're talking about leaders, that those qualities which can only really be um, put into people's lives by the Holy Spirit, that those qualities are there and those qualities are being developed. So that what we have in the church are truly spiritual leaders. I mean, how can the church be a people of the Spirit and therefore spiritual people unless they're led by men and women who are spiritual people? Do people you think of the Spirit. Do you think it was really necessary for Judas to be replaced, for there to be 12 disciples again? Yes, the reason for that is that um, to form a synagogue, and we must remember that the church in its earliest days was regarded as a Jewish sect. To be a synagogue, you had to have 12 men. So they would have the perfect right to meet as a separate group rather than to join another synagogue in Jerusalem if there were 12 appointed men. Now, obviously, around uh, those 12 men, there were already this bigger group of people, including the women that had ministered to Jesus. So it's a group of men and women. But that actually made them officially um, recognizable. As, as an entity within themselves. So it was a necessary thing to do. It was a necessary thing to do, and they, they saw the rightness of that, that. That's why Jesus had 12 disciples and not 10 um, during his lifetime, and it's why they saw the need to, um, uh, to keep that number 12 in their leadership. Uh, of course, as the church developed in later years and became more and more Gentile and less and less Jewish in its ethos, then that no longer was seen to be a requirement in the same way. Well, then the ten days were up and the Holy Spirit came. Yes, and we're going to talk about this much more in detail next week, but we can just record the event. It was on the day of Pentecost when they were all gathered together. Now, the the Greek there means that they were to gathered together, not just being together, but they were gathered together as one. There was this unity among them. Uh, that suddenly there came a sound from heaven like the blowing of a gale force wind filling the place where they were meeting. They saw coming upon each of them what appeared to be flames of fire, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages that the Spirit gave them. So as we look at this um, next week, we're going to have some interesting questions to ask, to answer. For example, when the Spirit came upon Jesus, uh, he came upon him as a dove, gently lighting upon him. When he came upon the disciples, it was like a gale force wind and a fire. Now, this is the same Holy Spirit. 
Why should he come upon Jesus like a dove? And why upon the disciples like a gale force wind and a raging fire? Well, the simple answer, I'll, give, I'll begin to give you the answer now, <laughs> is that in Jesus there was absolutely nothing to resist the Holy Spirit. He could just gently come upon him because he was totally at one with his Father. When the Holy Spirit blows through the life of any of us, he has to blow out everything. He has to rush through our lives like a gale force wind to free us from everything that is opposed to the Spirit, that restricts the Spirit, that inhibits the Spirit, so that then the Spirit of God can flow out of us. The fire of God, which in Scripture is um, one of the symbols of judgment and of purification, the fire of the Spirit comes to purify us from everything that is not of God, everything that is not of the Spirit, so that now we can be the witnesses that are freed from everything in our lives that restricted and hindered God from really having his way with us in the way that he desires and frees us to be the people that are moving with the wind and the fire of God in our lives. So uh, even, even in the way in which the Holy Spirit comes upon us, there is so much to learn. You've been listening to Faith for Today, presented by Julia Fisher. This program is sponsored by Kingdom Faith. For further information, visit our website, kingdomfaith.com. 